computer. It's in progress. And good afternoon, everyone. This is Touch of Faith Radio and Ministry. Uh, we are here today after a little hiatus. Uh, I have to do a little bit of bouncing all over the place, but we are finally back. And we left off with the question of the glorious land as we found in Daniel 11 and verse 41. And so today our objective is to get to that idea and to answer that question of glorious land. Where is it? What is it? Does it exist? Um, <laughs> where should we look to find it? Um, I think those are important questions. And why is it important today? Is it important today? Um, but before we begin, we make sure before we begin, we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to dig right into the topic. And we're going to back up a little bit to refresh ourselves. And then we're going to move forward. So let's pray and let's move forward. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity once again that we can come and spend some time with you as we now go into this study to discover the truth behind the glorious land and your chosen people. We pray that your spirit will guide us into all truth. Be with us now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, give me a second. I forgot to do one very important thing here. Let's see if I can do that really quickly. I discovered the importance of this is that I need to sign in on a secondary advice, device because if I don't, what happens is I'm not sure what everybody sees. And if something goes wrong, you know, people say, I don't hear you. I want to be able to detect that in advance and have that corrected. So we're not, I'm not speaking and no one is catching what I'm saying. You know, I, I watch so many broadcasts, um, especially on Zoom and you can't understand what's happening and everyone is going on like if everything is fine because no one at that location is actually monitoring what is being dispersed. And, you know, it, 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 it could cause people not to tune in anymore. So this machine is trying its best to sign in for some strange reason. It's having a difficulty. Oh, I know why. <laughs> it will make sense if all these nice little gadgets were on. <laughs> okay, now I should be able to sign in now. Okay, let me try this again. I forgot that on this device, we turn off everything to prevent. Okay, there you go. Three. Boy, a lot of people are trying to contact me. That's why I turned this thing off. Did it start yet? Uh, we are starting now. Okay. okay I'm glad I didn't miss anything, even though. Okay. I, there we go. I, th I think I you missed it. We haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, it's been a long time, it feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've been well. Your wife's been well. Yeah, actually, I've been doing better than normal, so I thank God for that. Praise God, yeah. Yeah, yeah awesome. That's good, that's good. I'm a quick healer, so I just, I'm a very quick healer, so I just thank God for that. Praise God. Amen. And I'm diabetic. My, I know my friend, he knows me from a long time ago, and he said, no, you're diabetic. You can't be a quick healer. <laughs> it's God, not me. It's God. God's the power, not me. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. Anyone remembers what the homework assignment was? <laughs> the homework no. assignment was where is the glorious land, or what is the glorious land? What is the glorious land? Anyone has any ideas? I'm gonna back up, and I have a couple of texts. Let me bring my. Let me share my screen. Let me put this on the screen. Well, oh, this is too far back. Let me see. I'm gonna quickly start from here. Um, let's share my screen here and do, do, do. okay, share the screen and take this to whew. let's go here. We might have a different view on it. I don't know. We'll see. It's possible. <laughs> it is possible. I I am. Um, so what is your thought on the glorious land? The glorious land, my thought is it related to the glorious holy mountain and the glorious holy mountain. But well, what was the holy city? That was Jerusalem, right? So mm -hmm. Jerusalem was the holy city. 
And I go to back to the Bible um, in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter um, 11, verse uh, 45. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. So the glorious holy mountain, that's interesting. I mm -hmm. thought, well, who, what was the holy city, which is Jesus? So the holy mountain must have been either the Mount of Olives, or in this case, I think the glorious holy mountain was the Adventist church. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? No one else? Everyone else silent? I, I want to bring us. Well, I have something that I was looking into. Um, sorry, it's hard for me to unmute it. It's slow. But mm -hmm. what Daniel Cox was mentioning, and mm -hmm. uh, can you guys hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm going to read what Daniel Cox had said. And it kind of made sense to me. Hold on a second. Of course, now I can't find it. Hold on. Mm -hmm. aye, aye, aye. Okay. All righty. I'm going to go to where he says, uh, the verse says, he shall also enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but he shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Amon. So what he says is, these verses parallel Revelation 17 with the woman Babylon sitting on the scarlet colored beast that the entire world, including the glorious land, and he has in parentheses the Middle East, will follow. In my opinion, the words of Gabriel seem to indicate that there may be a confrontation between Catholicism and Islam. The countries listed are Islamic in belief, and from what the scriptures imply, the descendants of Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Amon, which make up modern-day Jordan comma, will not go along with the papacy, but Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia, Ethiopia will follow out in the foots of Catholicism. Only time will tell how this will all work out. And Jesus said, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So um, in a way that kind of makes sense to me, because the um, what is modern day Jordan and the, I live in a pretty um, Islamic neighborhood and they seem to not really quite get the difference but they're definitely against Israel but they have ideas of peace so I think that there is going to be this confrontation between what are the Islamic people now and Catholicism. It's, they might know because their roots go back to uh, Abraham. And I was talking to a lady in um, one of the stores up here who's from Yemen. And they are very tied to their roots of Abraham. So I think that might help not going along with Catholicism. So yeah. that's kind of what I have thought about it a little. Okay. Anyone else? We're trying to discover the glorious land. Anyone have a thought about the glorious land? Now, I, I want to do something here. Um, I didn't want to go back this far, but I'm not sure where to find what I'm looking for. Um, let me see if I can do this quickly. Um, well, this goes back to verse 40. And I'm, I'm, I, I just want us to remind us uh, uh, what the where principle is. I'll come back to this slide in a second. Um, the where principle tells us something important. The where principle tells us that when we move from the old dispensation to the new dispensation, God's people no longer are a literal body of people. So when, and, and the transition occurs when Jesus comes, he dies and resurrects. 
at that point, there is no longer a literal group of people or a nation of people that we say these are Israel. It changes from this literal body of Israel into a spiritual body. Now, I want to read a text before I go on. This is found in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to actually make this screen larger. And the reason why I do and why I'm doing that, because I could see how it appears on the screen. And so I'm taking into consideration that someone has never read the Bible before. And I want them to give an opportunity to read this. So I'm reading Daniel 9 and verse 27. And this could be seen on a cell phone because I am watching what you're seeing on a small cell phone. That's how, and I don't have my glasses on and I could read it. So I know it can be seen by someone who is with a cell phone. Now notice what Daniel said. And it says, and this is the ending of his 490 year prophecy that was given to literal Israel in reference to literal Jerusalem. Now he says, and he, this is what I'm looking for. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I want to start up a little further. I want to start at verse 26. And he says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolation. And he shall confirm the covenant for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice, let me scroll down, and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now I read that before I read the text that I wanted to read, which is verse 25, because I wanted us to see what would happen to God's people and their land. He was going to make God's people and their land desolate until the consummation or until God came to gather his people. So what was that about his people? This is the verse here that is the key for many people who are Sunday keepers. And I invited many Sunday keepers to tune in today because this question has to be answered in order to truly find Jesus. Now, I have to say it that way because there are many false Christ. And there are many false Jesus, says, if you say that. This verse is going to help you to find the true Savior. Now, notice how this prophecy begins. This is verse 25. I left this for last. <laughs> Look at 25. It says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score, two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the walls, even in troublous times. Now, I read that because this prophecy is directed exclusively to Daniel's people and Daniel's city. Daniel's people and Daniel's city. And what we know is that at the end of it, Daniel's people and his city their sacrificial service causes sacrifice and the oblations to cease. 
will no longer be a valid method of salvation. And the city would also be desolate. So what this helps us to do is to rule out physical Israel and physical Jerusalem as being the glorious land and God's people. Now I'm going to go back yet another verse. And I'm, I'm doing this because someone just sent something that I want to answer by reading verse 24. Because the question was, how do I know he was talking about God's people? That's basically the question that I'm reading. Verse 24 of the prophecy. Can anyone see verse 24 and read that for us? This is Daniel 9, 24. Or if you have a Bible, you could read it in Daniel 9, 24. I'll read. Go ahead. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin to and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay. So this prophecy is directed directly at Daniel's people, the Jewish nation, and to the holy city, which was Jerusalem. <laughs> and, and by the way, at this time, Jerusalem was called the pleasant land or the glorious land. So the initial understanding of the glorious land or the pleasant land was Jerusalem. Christ was there. God's spirit had come and settled in the temple. And it was like having heaven on earth. That's the initial understanding of the glorious land. And no Bible scholar really questioned that. But they were going to put, be put to a test. 70 weeks, and we spent forever looking at this turns out to be 490 years. At the end of that 490 years, something was going to happen. And what was going to happen? The Messiah, matter of fact, let me go back to the text. At the end of this time, the Messiah, the Prince, was going to come. This is how we know when Jesus was going to be born. This is how we know how long the ministry of Christ was going to be in the middle of the week, three and a half years. That's what this prophecy did. It, 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 it takes us directly to the ending of this prophecy when God's literal people and God's literal city were going to have to decide to accept the Messiah or not. 457 BC to uh, AD 27. Is that what it was? 70 weeks prophecy? 70 week prophecy. All right. And they had to finish transgression. All right. <laughs> Let me highlight it as I go. Finish transgression. Make an end of sin. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. That's what their assignment. And Christ was going to appear to Israel at the end of this prophecy. And so what this does it forces us to come to the conclusion of the prophecy and to see whether or not literal Israel would end sin, reconcile, make a reconciliation for iniquity, bring an everlasting righteousness by giving Christ to the world, seal up the vision and the prophecy, this whole moray that we're talking about, will they live it out? And then anoint Christ as the Holy Son of God. That's what Daniel told me. That was the vision that had come to Daniel, the Marais, and Gabriel explained to him, 
This is what your people had to do when the Messiah would appear. And so Israel lived for the next 490 years waiting for that day. And I, I want to jump to another verse here really quickly. This is John 1. And I want to begin at verse 36. Because this is now the end of the 490 years. And I want us to see what took place, what transpired. So who could read that for us? This, this is John 1. We're reading verse 36 to verse 38. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, verse 37. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? Okay. So the first thing we see is Jesus being called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Peter said, what's the big deal about that? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump back to Daniel 9. I'm going to be jumping back and forth before we actually get to the text for a moment. Because part of what they had to do, I had to deal with, was anointing the most holy. Now, this idea of anointing the most holy has two implications. First, Christ as the most holy, and two, the tabernacle as the most holy. And so we, we have to keep that in mind because Jerusalem is where the tabernacle is. Uh -huh. And Christ, the Lamb of God, that takes away what from the world? Anyone? Sins. The sins bring in everlasting righteousness. So when John, right, that's, 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 the, uh, that's why I'm going to go slow here. When John identifies him as the Lamb of God, he is pointing to Christ being the instrument by which our sins will be taken away. Exactly. You see, so if we don't recognize Christ as that Lamb, there's no reconciliation for sin. But let's go down a little further in this discussion, right? First, well, let me go to 41, because we're talking about these two who identified Christ, right? Verse 40 said, one of the two heard John speak, that means he heard John said the Lamb of God, followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41, he first find his own brother Simon and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is interpreted the Christ. So two things just happened. First, he was the Lamb of God, but Andrew understood that the Lamb of God was the Messiah, the deliverer, the one who would take away our sins. Now, this is important because this occurs at the end of the 490 years. At the end of the 490 years. And that is what's paramount. So I'm going to jump back to this, and I don't need to go back. I think I covered all of this really quickly just now. Can I make a comment, please? Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I think uh, he's the Messiah, meaning he's the anointed one. He's the Christ, right? That's important mm -hmm. to know. But also, he's not just the Messiah. He's the best friend. Jesus is the best personal friend. So by faith, we can understand that he lives in my heart. He lives in your heart. By faith, we can understand that. And um, various things, we, we, we can understand that he's always there for us. Jesus never turned away the sick empty. He never did. Correct. Okay, I think I see your hand. Yes. Oh, but did, didn't uh, Christ accomplish all that verse 24 says were to be accomplished? Now, did Christ, let's go to Daniel 9, 24. Is Christ going to fulfill all of this? The answer is yes. Does God need Israel? No. But Israel needs God 
right. to remain his people. So whether or not Israel recognizes Christ is somewhat irrelevant, but it's relevant in when we are trying to identify Israel, spiritual Israel, and the holy city and the glorious land. So Christ would fulfill everything in Daniel 9.24. The problem, Israel does not accept any of it. And the holy city was Jerusalem because it had the holy temple. Yes. Okay. So, uh, oh, well, I'm going to, let me, let me just go here. Something, do something here really quickly. Or should I wait? I'll, 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 I'll do it now. <laughs> I'll do it now. Notice what happens here. And this is all that same time period. Now notice what Jesus said here. This is Matthew 23 and verse 38. Jesus turns to the scribes and the Pharisees. They had rejected him. And he makes this statement. Behold, your house is left. left unto you desolate. Elena, I see your hand. Okay. I think we determined from before that Jesus is up in heaven officiating. And Jesus is God's lamb of sacrifice up there in the in heaven, mm -hmm. in the real tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So if what, um, uh, if what Kenneth, mm -hmm. Kenneth Cox is saying, it appears to me that spiritually then, there will be Islamic people who will not go along with um, the, Catholic, the Catholic stuff when it comes down to the persecution and all of that. They will be looking at things spiritually, I think, because of their ties to Esau. And if this is all spiritual, like we had determined, because now it's passed from earth to heaven, yeah. they will have a spiritual eye of understanding. They won't just be looking at this physical stuff because of course it doesn't exist you know so i think god has a people in all of these now i don't know why it says that egypt um and maybe there will be spiritual egyptians because egypt had quite enough time to really understand what the true gospel was from moses and all of their plagues and all of that they should have gotten it a long time ago so um i think that if we're looking at it, like we say, I had determined that it's up in heaven and there will be people who will spiritually be able to discern right from wrong. That's um, what I'm thinking. Okay. I, okay. Yeah, I had, a, I had a quote for that from the Bible. Isaiah mm -hmm. chapter 43, verse 5. Fear not, for I'm with you. I'll bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. So in verse 6, I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bringing my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. So God's going to bring out the, bl the blind, the halt, the halt, the blind, the deaf. He's going to bring those people, and he's going to bring them out of uh, mm -hmm. really Babylon, but he's going to bring out other ones too. I don't, I don't, I don't know who all is going to be saved, but he's going to bring it from every nation, right? Every nation. Every, na every nation. That makes right. that point. So every nation becomes spiritual Israel. So God, let, let, me, let, me, let me do something here. This, um, let's going to find this really quickly. Uh, um, is this what I want to find? Um, I remember this verse. It came in my head in a second. I'll remember it in a second. But every, every, every nation, Israel is... Spiritual Israel is going to come from every nation, not just some nations, from every kindred, tongue, and people. And so whereas prior to this point, Israel was local and literal, Israel now is going to make a shift. Let me back up for a moment here. I'm in Daniel, um, 
I mean, Revelation 7, and I want to go to verse 1 for a moment. I think this is where I want, verse 1 I want to start. Yes. Um, Revelation 7, verse 1. Now, we use this text in many ways, but I'm going to use this way to show that God divides um, Israel to some extent into two groups. In Revelation 7, we often look at this as the ceiling of the 144,000. And it says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, right? Um, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. Um, and I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels whom it was given to hurt the earth. And the message he had was, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. And he said, I heard the number of them were sealed. And this is where we get the number of 144,000. But notice here, in 144,000, it says that they were all of the tribe of Israel. And he goes to enumerate what at this time had made up the tribe of Israel. Now, people say, well, what happens to Dan and stuff like that? That's okay. But they, regardless of the names that are here, be it Asher, Gad, Judah, Naphtali, these are all Israel. They are all from literal Israel. But now, notice the second group, the spiritual group. This is at verse 9. He says, after this, I beheld... And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, all kindred, all people, all tongue, stood before the throne and before the Lamb. So the point is here, in, as the Bible comes to a crescendo, God identifies two Israels. One which was literal and one that represented everyone else, even those that were in literal Israel. Elena, I see your hand. Okay, so going back to God's promise to Abraham, uh, it was that it was going to be two great nations. You know, um, he had uh, those that came from Abraham and Jacob and, and Esau, he said, um, from Hagar. That, that was going to be a great nation too. So if we're looking at it spiritually, since Israel opted out, then Hagar's the the spiritual, I guess, um, pagans took over, and that's where if we come for fast forward to Stephen, where the gospel is now open to all nations, then it it all kind of makes sense, no? Uh, yes, the gospel becomes available to all nations. Everyone now has access to God. But we can, can we include the Islamic stuff because they were the other not, nation that God said? But not, you see, everyone has access, but not in their own religion. Now let me let me do something because that's a, this is a this is a point that I want to spend just a little time on. I, I did I wasn't going here, but I need to spend a little time here because I don't want people to have the wrong idea. And I'm gonna couch this in the idea of choice. Um, choice. Um, what happens oftentimes? God gives us choice, and sometimes we figure because we have choice, we can choose wrong and still be on God's side. So sometimes when I'm talking about, people ask, who are you going to vote for? And I say, well, you can't vote for anyone who limits choice. And then the person would say, well, that means then you support abortion. I says, no, I don't support that either. They say, so how could you have both? Very simple. Just because I think we have choice doesn't make abortion right. It's still murder. Just because I have choice doesn't mean I have a choice to practice homosexuality. That is still a perversion of what God said. So two things can be true. So while Islam could have access to God, 
choosing to follow, um, what's this guy's name, Muhammad, will not save you. So you will have to give up Muhammad and follow Christ. So in Daniel, I mean, John 10, 16, notice what Jesus says. He says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Fold means the way in which we worship. He was worshiping. He says, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold, one shepherd. You see, when they came to Christ, they couldn't come with their teaching in their fold because it's only going to be one fold. So they had to yield what they believed. That's what it means to hear his voice and follow him. And the last verse I want to give here is found in same John 16 to 24 to build on this position. And it says, um, is it 24, 16? Yeah, 24. Sorry, I got it backwards. <laughs> I think I got it. 20, 20, I think I got it backwards. Um, okay. What is it? Wonderful. Uh, yes. One second. I have to sometime wreck my brains, but that's what I had. Where is this text? Isn't it 1024, 1624? If any man would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. Any, it's Matthew? Matthew 1624. And, and I got John. <laughs> so here goes what Jesus said. Then said Jesus unto them, his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Deny um, Buddha. Right. Deny false Christ. Right. Deny papacy. Mm -hmm. So when he calls us, going back now, that's what got myself all confused, John 10, 16. Any man shall hear my voice. In order to come into God's fold, you must deny that. So while it is true that Muslims will be saved, they will not be saved. I, I, Muslims then would not so much mean the religion they have, uh -huh. the identity of the people. Okay. Because sometimes uh -huh. we think Muslim is a body of people rather than a religion. Muslim mm -hmm. is, to be a Muslim is a religion you practice. So you could be in Turkey and be a Muslim, Iran and be a Muslim, in America and a Muslim. Muslim is a religion. So in okay. order to be saved, you must yield that. And if you want to be saved as a Jew, you must yield your Jewish beliefs and follow Christ. And so okay. all will be saved that way. It's accessible to all. So yeah. our choice does not allow us to choose wrong and demand salvation in our wrong choice. So I was I the agree. Story. Go ahead, Elena. I, I agree. Um, and I had asked if the Quran is translated into um, um, something that they could understand. I forget. But anyway, I had heard that there's a pastor, Stephen Dickey, who has a ministry to preach to the Islamics so that they too can have their opportunity to accept Christ. And it's true, they can't... Um, be um, Islamic Muslims and think that Muhammad and Christ together are giving them salvation. That doesn't that doesn't make sense. Yeah. But the spiritual, they will be able to discern spiritually when the time comes because there is ministry going to them. And um, the Quran, I think I had asked if it was translated into other in Hebrew or something, so that they could really understand it. Because I was um, defending a little bit a little lady up here in the Bronx who is Islamic, and I had the opportunity to share with her about some of these things, and uh, um, and I gave her a little pamphlet on who are the Adventists, because mm -hmm. they don't have a clear view now. But like it says, other sheep. He's exactly. Calling. He's calling them now in whichever capacity they need to be reached in. So the Islamists, which I, if, uh, like I say, Edom, 
and Amman and all of those countries that were the other um, mm -hmm. big nation that God promised, they will have their opportunity as well because he's, they are his sheep. Yeah, so his sheep. Now, let me, let, me, let me speak to this issue of the sheep. The sheep ultimately becomes those who hear him and follow him. And, and the reason I want to be distinct in that, because I've had some people said that's because the Bible says the poor in spirit. Some people say, as long as I'm poor, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> that's, that's not what it means. Oh, no. <laughs> but you have some people who, who think that way. So his oh. sheep are the ones who hear his voice and come into the fold. And then they become his. It's like the master. The, the, the master, there are many sheep in the garden, but if when he calls the sheep do not come, then the sheep belongs to someone else. So ultimately, the sheep are those who hear his voice and follow him to safety. So God is going to put out a call to all his people. And this is what we're going to talk about a little bit today, if we get to it, about the purpose of Israel. It was to, uh, to make that call so that his people from all walks of life could hear and be saved. Now, I had seen Andrew's hand up also, um, so I want to flip back over there. I think we're still sharing the screen. It looks different. But go ahead. Yeah, I just I want to say that keep Jesus first and paramount first, and he's the one that we can love. Um, he's not going to trash us, you know, in the sense that he's not going to leave or forsake us. He's got a great love for us, and he's not going to fail. So, um. His love is unfailing, unfailing love, unmeasurable love. So he's got so much love for us. Um, I think that also that um, Jesus is his, if, if we understand Jesus, who he is, that God is love, 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16, that God is love. And that um, we understand that um, he wouldn't lead us where we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't choose for ourselves if we saw the end from the beginning. So um, if we saw the end from the beginning, we'd choose exactly what God chose for us, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and you know, and, and, and I want to stress that, you know, because God is love. Um, Jesus is going to lead. And I want to stress again this prophecy because many, <laughs> many people say they love Jesus. Many Christians claim to be following Jesus, but then as you sit and talk with them, you run into this scenario real quickly that the Jesus that they follow and the Jesus that you know from the Bible cannot be the same. One Jesus tells them that obedience is important, and another Jesus, their Jesus says, I can keep sinning and be saved. Something is wrong. And so this helps us to know who is the right Jesus. Remember the warning of Christ, there will be false Christ in the end. And so let me let me continue here. I didn't want to go back this far, but this was Daniel 40. And I was talking about the king of the north because all of this is couched in the idea of the king of the north and versus the king of the south. And that the king of the south would come up to the king of the north and there will be a battle. And while they're having the battle, the king of the north would then retaliate. And in the retaliation, he would subdue and crush the king of the south. But the story did not end there. There would be yet another shift in the battle, or the counterattack, should we say. And this is where um, Lewis Weir, this Weir principle, um, well, Lewis Weir would say something which was important. This was the recovery after the attack. Because remember when France attacked and no, excuse me, Napoleon attacked the papacy and the papacy fell and the world cheered, yes, yes, no more Pope. And they danced in the street for three and a half years and France passed the law, no more religion, but then they quickly changed their mind. Um, the world thought that at that stage, it was done. The papacy would never, ever come back again. After facing such a terrible defeat, they would, they would cease to be. But in the middle of all of that, this same Lewis Ware with the Lewis principle made this statement. He says, Communist, communism is one of the great barrier between her, the papacy, and her goal. 
This barrier she regrets as a serious hindrance to the acquisition of the world control. This barrier she seeks to remove. The scripture declared that she will overcome this tremendous barrier. The land of Egypt shall not escape. The countries that had adopted godly, I mean, godless communism will not escape her, the papacy control. Now, everybody thought Louis Weir was crazy. How, how can he make that statement? He said, the church is dead. Right now, because people think it was over with Napoleon. No, after Napoleon, one by one, the world changed drastically and communism exploded. Places where the papacy had been became communist, meaning we don't want any religion. Don't teach religion. If you go to Cuba today, you want to know what the number one religion in Cuba is? Anyone knows what the number one religion in Cuba is? Catholicism. Catholicism, yeah. Catholicism. Yeah. If you go to Russia, guess what the number one religion is in Russia? They're yeah, the same. It's the same. You can go to all those former Soviet countries that were that had replaced what the Pope had did, and they all have gone right back to communism. There was a counterattack by the papacy, and it swallowed the country. Now, I'm getting somewhere because we are still trying to answer this question of the glorious land, all right? So there's a counterattack. I'm, I'm going through a lot of this because we covered this before and I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, Neil, are you raising your hand or are you just paying attention? Paying attention, all right? And so there was going to be a counterattack. Now, I want us to just look at some of the statements here from Ellen White. And, and, and these are going to prove to be important because then we're going to, to understand the glorious land, we must first understand why God initially set up Israel as the glorious land. And these statements are going to help us to understand that better. So notice what great controversy says here. He says, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side, men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. Now, Ellen White is making this statement to the seventh day Adventist church. Now, the reason I read this, because the counterattack by the king of the north affects the seventh day Adventist church. Just like when God had planted physical Israel in physical and literal Jerusalem, apostasy entered God's remnant people. They were not going to be immune to the counterattack. And we need to get that here. <laughs> Some people think just by having the title Seventh-day Adventist is protection on its own. It was not a protection for Israel. They became perverted, defiled. And the result was, as we looked at Matthew 23 and verse 38, God said he removed his spirit from them and the glorious land then was destroyed. Let me, let me go down to this verse because... 
again, this is for Christians of all stripe who are struggling with this concept that physical Israel and literal Jerusalem are not the glorious land and are not God's people. So right after, this is Matthew, let me show you this, and this is to say you have to remember that in the Bible, in its original forms, we do not have paragraphs and we do not have numbers. Those were put there so that you and I could follow and reference points much easier. So when Jesus finished making the statement, behold, your house or Israel's house is left unto you desolate. And then he says, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The next thing he begins to say is not a pleasing thought. And it says that Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? Verily, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus was telling them that the once glorious land, remember this is the land that was flowing with milk and honey, with every opportunity, was going to be destroyed. So I say that because God's people were not immune from the counterattack that was to come from the king of the north. We are looking again for the answer to what or who or where is the glorious land of today. That's what we're looking for. So we know there's a counterattack. I'm not going to go through all of this. I'm not going to go to the, the nuance of the counterattack. I want to move forward. And I want to go here because this is about where we left off when we met last. Okay, um, the recovery, the geographical progression of the king of the north conquest in Daniel 11 to 11 verses 40 to 45 follows the Euphrates River stage, right? The overflowing rivers originate in Babylon, moves west to the glorious land of Palestine and overthrows many people. As it overflows Edom, Moab, Ammon, east of Israel, some escape to Jerusalem. The overflow continues south, overtaking Egypt, Ethiopia, and Libya. So that's what we see in these verses. And so we'll get into Edom, Moab, Ammon in a second. But this is about where we left off. The counterattack would happen. Israel would, um, they would attack Israel. Um, but Israel would stand at this moment, but some of the people in that process, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, they would fall, some will escape, run to Israel. And now this is important because it tells us that some of God's people, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, which Elena was saying, escape back to the glorious land. But some didn't go to the glorious land. Some ran further south. Some ran further west or east, but they did not go back to God as the emphasis. So not all people will return to God when the counterattack is levied on the glorious land. And I, I, and I want to say it that way because yesterday someone said to me, I don't understand how people will see all these disasters and not worship God. People tell me that. People say, well, I don't understand. If that was me and all these bad things would happen, I would follow Jesus. You ever, ever thought about that? People, or anyone ever told you something like that? Because we think that automatically when people see bad, the, the, their recourse is to go to what they perceive to be good. 
what we don't understand or what we're not realizing is the reason we think God is good is because we believe. To other people, good means the person with the biggest gun. Let me illustrate that point. The United Nations has a group called the uh, UN Peacekeeping Force. Anyone knows what they're supposed to do? <laughs> No, but it sounds like a dichotomy because peacemaking and then force, it's like <laughs> opposites. <Yeah>. Hello. <laughs> so the UN peacekeeping force are supposed to keep the peace. A few years ago, they had several of these peacekeepers on trial for uh, abuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a dichotomy, definitely. That's so and, funny. And but the reason we have the P, let me try another one. Anyone knows what NATO is? N A T O? No one North knows Atlantic what NATO is? North Atlantic Treaty Organization. North American no. Treaty Organization. Yeah. But, okay. But I'll give, I'll give, I, I had two different answers. Right? So I'll just say yes, I won't tell you who was right, who was wrong. But anyone knows the purpose of NATO? To. It, to, to not keep the peace, to oppose the Russians. To oppose the Russians by any means necessary. Now, when NATO, the only time NATO has ever functioned as a group was at 9-11. When the buildings fell with Saudi pilots in every plane, right, and crashed into the World Trade Center, NATO became active and they hunted down quote unquote the terrorists in every country and all of NATO responded to that crisis and in the end they arrested some people they finally found Ben Laden yada, yada. they were willing to kill for the sake of peace so goodness to people is not necessarily going to God Goodness is going to the person with the biggest gun who agrees with my point of view. That's why you join NATO or the axes of evil or the Nazis when it was ja um, um, Japan and Hitler, because Hitler and the Nazis were in agreement, Russia and China and North Korea in agreement, and they believe that they are good. But here in the glorious land, I see you, Andrew, I come to you in a second. It tells us that some of Eden, some of Moab, some of Ammon escaped to Israel. But some is not the same as all. That lets us know that the, our perception of what is good is different. Andrew. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, but these shall escape from his hand, Eden, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. End quote in King James. So, I mean, I think that it brings out the honorable people will be saved too. Many honorable people will be saved in Ammon as well. So, but um, I it's interesting that I like this illustration because it's pretty good. And you know, like, if I I say, oh, drink this smoothie, you'll you'll have a lot of nutrition and you might feel better. Mm -hmm. And and the people say, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. No, I'm not going to. And it's like salvation. It's yeah. easy to attain. It's simple to understand. It's easy. A child can understand it. It's easy to get. But the, many people are just like, oh, I don't want to. I'm I'm in trouble. I know I'm scared of the time of trouble. I'm in trouble and I don't want to be saved. But, uh, you know, when you offer the keys to heaven and they still don't take them, I don't understand it. Yeah. You know, what, what, gets, what gets me the most, someone would come. You know, they are call and they have some kind of malady. And I said, I need you to do this to have better health. And then they don't do it. And then their health wanes. And then they call me again. And I'm like, why are you calling me if you're not going to do what I tell you? Exactly. But I can't force them because they have choice. And their choice is either going to <laughs> determine whether or not they'll get better or stay ill. So God gives us that choice. And we must choose. So when it, um, some of the people in 
Edom, some of the people in Moab, some of the people in Ammon, some of the people that were in Jericho, some of the people that were Ai, some of the people in these cities recognized that the God of Israel was the true God, and they ran to him for deliverance. But the others did not. They went elsewhere. On Wednesday, we study Isaiah. And I remember many weeks back, we were looking, I think it was in chapter 7, chapter 7, and Ahaz was given an opportunity to be delivered before the people went into captivity. And Ahaz, who was the king, says, I'm not going to go to God. And he went into captivity. He had the remedy for deliverance, but he refused his own choice not to go. Okay, so there's going to be a counterattack, and a counterattack is going to absorb many, but the noble people, the righteous people, those who are looking for salvation are going to find the right God, the right Lamb of God, and be saved. And be saved. That's why Christ came. Amen. So, so summary to this point, and then we're going to get to some text for today. Summary. Um, at the time of the end, 1798, the king of the South, France, atheistic communist, will push, give a deadly wound at the king of the North, the papacy. But the king of the North, the papacy, will recover from the attack. The deadly wound will be healed by means of horses, chariots, and many ships, military and economic powers. Take the kingdom of the North, the papacy, will defeat the king of the South, atheistic communism. The victory of the king of the north, the papacy, will be compatible to the devastation caused by the great river Euphrates at the flood stage. So that was Daniel 11, all the way up to verse 40. That's where we are. But then when we get to 41, there's going to be an account. I'm going to pass this. I'm going to pass this and see you in two weeks. But I want to read this first. It says, he shall enter also. In addition to what he has done, he will enter also into the glorious land. And many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, let me say this. If we move the glorious land to after Christ died, resurrected, and went to heaven, and everything becomes spiritual, then it makes full sense that here um, many people are going to escape. Because it says that many countries shall be overthrown. Now, let me tell you why in a second I saw a hand go up and down. I'm not sure whose hand it was. But let me tell you why I, I say this. God's end time people come from every nation, every tribe, and every people. And if God's nation is every tribe, every people, and tongue, and language, if there's a counterattack, then every country is going to be impacted by that. My wife was hinting at that uh, this week because she kept asking me, and um, I don't I don't give out answers. Mm -hmm. She has some great points. So she's, actually, she just needs to be firm on her beliefs. That's my wife. My wife just needs to be firm. I'm not going to change. Right? And she didn't change. I don't think she changed. But um, she made some points about the glorious land being everywhere. And notice what happens. Many countries shall be overthrown. But the papacy is hunting for who? God's people. And if he's hunting everywhere, the people are everywhere. So the glorious land now begins to take on a different shape, somewhat. And I'll get to that in a second. Because it has to encompass everyone. But but before I give an answer, before you guess, I'm going to give something to just really confuse you more. Um, physical Israel was in a literal location, geographical location, yet the gospel had reached the, all the ends of the world. And so we see the Ethiopian unit coming back to a physical location to worship. 
Because from that physical location is how the gospel got to where he was. And so God had placed his people someplace to spread the gospel into all the world. Now, some might say, oh, well, there you go. It has to be on the physical location. Does it really? So I, I didn't want to give away any answers. So that's why I said that, right? So there's no doubt that the glorious land of old, I should put there, represent the geographical territory of Israel. The same word is translated pleasant land in Daniel 8, 9, and in Jeremiah 3, 19. The pleasant land, glorious land, are all synonymous. However, in John 4, 20 to 24, Jesus made it clear that after Pentecost, there would be no more literal and local holy lands or holy mountains. So the question we must ask is, what does the glorious land represent? And I said, see you in two weeks. So that is where we want to pick up now, the glorious land, Saturday at 5.30. Is it America? Is the glorious land America? Now I'm going to tell you why I, I'm asking that question. And that's the text here, Daniel 11.41. And he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Mo Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, I had seen a hand flash up, but I think it flashed off. So I don't know if somebody wants to ask the question. If you do, you can. Okay. So let's take, we're going to take a look at a couple of texts. I put the text on the screen to save some time. Okay, that's why I put the text on the screen, to save us some time. It says, literally speaking, most Bible students conclude that the glorious land of Scripture represents the territory of Israel. However, Scripture is clear that Israel rejected Christ. Now, these are for those who struggle with that concept. Uh, on Thursday, we were doing a study. Thursday is an international study. And um, I was trying to convey the idea of us being stewards of God's word and how Israel was an unfaithful steward, just like Jesus told the parable of the unfaithful steward. So what I did, I went to 1 Corinthians chapter, matter of fact, I'll go here now. I, I was reading that to my wife today, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus' parables were not haphazard. It really were pointing out the flaws of his then chosen people. Notice what Paul said. He says, someone read that for us. 1 Corinthians 4 yeah. verses 1 all the way to verse 3. Uh, well, actually, one let is a man so let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. There you but go. With me, it is, very, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's uh, judgment. Yea, I judge not my mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore, Amen. judge nothing before mine until the Lord come, who both will bring to light uh, the hidden things of darkness and will and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Okay, that's good right there. So the point I was making on Thursday was that as a follower of Christ, you become a steward of the mysteries of God, or you become a steward of God's things. Uh -huh. So Jesus told a parable of the unjust steward. Uh -huh. And quickly to go over the story, what happens, the, the, the master, right, who had employed the steward, discovered that the steward was stealing. So he called the steward and told the steward to give an account of the things he had. The steward, knowing, knowing that he would lose his job, went out to all the people that owed something to the master, 
And he says, how much do you owe my master? He said, 100. Quickly, write 50. And you, 50. Write 20. And whatever the story might be. And then Jesus said, the people of the world are wiser than, than the people in the church. But he called the steward unjust because the steward had robbed the master of his things. And then that parable was given to illustrate that those who, at the time, the Jewish nation, who were stewards of the mystery of God, were also unjust. Rather than giving the world God's truth, they gave them a false truth. They painted the world a false hope. And when Christ came, who was to judge all, the false stewards murdered Christ. That's how Christ came on the cross. So we too are stewards. And we have to be faithful. If not, we will reject Christ. Now, why I'm stressing this, because oftentimes, I said, I'm going to go back to this point. People say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And I hear that so much. But then I watch the behavior, and I say, the Jesus they love is not the Jesus of the Bible. So we have to be careful with that. You know, when, when Jesus came back from the cross, from the dead, and he's walking to Emmaus. We know the story of the two disciples who met him, right? And when Jesus got home with them, Jesus didn't bang on his chest and say, this is me, Jesus, remember me? He didn't do that. It said that he started with Moses and the prophets, and he used the Bible so that they could discover who he was. So when we want to find Jesus and his people, they must be following the Jesus of the Bible. Because what happened to God's chosen people and the glorious land is what we're looking at here now in John 1, 11, John 12, 37, and John 19 and verse 15. I just want to use this all from John. So in John 1, 11, it says that he, Christ, came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him. Here was the king of the universe, and they rejected Christ. The, do you remember when Jesus was picking corn on the Sabbath, and when he healed the lady on the Sabbath? The Jews said to Jesus, you sinned. So if Jesus sinned, would Jesus have been a spotless lamb? No. No. So if Jesus didn't sin, but the Jews concluded that he broke the law, is the law of the Jews and the law of Jesus the same? The answer is they can't. No. Yeah. No, no, they're not. No. But, it is this, but by principle, he gave the law in the right way. How they applied it was the wrong way. Possibly. But what we know is they could not be the same because they consistently condemned Christ to the point where they ultimately rejected him and said, nail him to the cross. But that's because they were evil. But the law was correct. Well, Matthew, five, let me let me do a couple of verses. The, the law that they quoted, <laughs> and how they could have a point, and how they understood it, was not the way that it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to go back to Matthew five for a second, seventeen, and this is Jesus speaking. He's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Mm -hmm. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The question I tell people to ask, why does he have to make that statement? What was happening that he had to make that statement? 
because the people being evil were misusing the law. They were um, not doing right by the people. They were unjust. They were um, robbing. They were stealing. They were mm-hmm. doing all sorts of atrocities in the temple and to God's people. To, so how they acted with the law was wrong, but the law was right because he did not come to just. Yeah, the law was right. He didn't come to destroy it. Now, and this is open to everyone. What did the people think of Jesus that made him have to make this statement? And this is for everyone. They thought thought by what he was doing, he was changing the whole system. Correct. So then he was acting against their law, as they see it. Exactly. The reason he makes this statement is because they had been calling him the son of Baal, the lawbreaker. And so he is confronting, he says, I didn't come to break the law. I came to fulfill the law. Because all the while, they were accusing him of violating this law. You see, so their understanding, their way of uh, explaining this law was false. Notice what he says in verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. So they, they, the Jews could say thou shalt not kill. But then Jesus takes it to another, another level. He says, but I say, he's separating himself from their teaching. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. You see, so Jesus is taking their misunderstanding and he's making it plain. And he's going to go through this many times. Again, you have heard that it has been said by them of old, thou shalt not forswear. And he corrects that understanding. Again, they also said, don't commit adultery. And he corrects their misunderstanding. You see, Jesus is correcting their false teaching about the law. And they are rejecting him. And John 12, on the screen, 38, he says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, Yet they believe not on him. Miracles do not make you believe. If they did, Christ would not have gone to the cross. I can't tell you how many people in my church are looking and waiting for miracles. And they say, well, how come we don't have miracles like the other churches? Bad news. A large group of them are going to be deceived. Oftentimes they had to believe to get the miracle. Yeah. But many people today are going to be deceived. The devil has so constructed and formed our last day that we believe seeing is believing. But Jesus taught us that the sure word of God is believing. Jesus said... We walk by faith and not by sight. So now we can't make a judgment. It says, oh, I didn't see it on the video, so he's innocent. I didn't see it on the video, so I can't believe it. We are being set up. We must go by the word of God. Miracles are not going to make you converted. And if you're looking for a miracle, the Bible says that the devil has something in store for you. I'm going to go to this here for a second um, because we need to understand. Notice what the devil has in store for those who need miracles to believe. This is Revelation 13, verse 14. And deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. There are many who are not accepting this message because they're waiting for the miracle. 
And it's the miracles that the devil is going to use to deceive us. Andrew, I see your hand. John chapter 12, verse 38, last part, it says, Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then verse 40, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. And quote New King James Version. So God blinded the Pharisees' eyes and the Sadducees' eyes so that they could, I essentially so that they could be saved. You know, God was trying to save them, them too. And he, he used parables to do that. And, um, because he wanted to heal them and they were really stubborn. So he wanted, and they were really, they had a lot of sins, they're religious forms. So, um, God was trying to heal them. He wanted to heal them. He was trying to heal them and he tried everything he could. And, and I like that's to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. God is revealing his arm of strength, his power to save, and he's revealing it to people and salvation is as simple as it is. And he's going to save a bunch of people. I want to, I want to bring that statement to today. I, I hate leaving things in the past, because today God is trying to do the exact same thing in the church. We have come to, a, we are Leo Decia. And Leo Decia, we don't like that phrase. We like to be called the remnant people, but the remnant people are the exact same people of the church of Leo Decia. And they are described as naked, blind, wretched, you know, in want and need, and they don't know it. Mm. So within all the churches, not excluding the Seventh day Adventist church, we walk around banging our chests in complete defiance to the word of God. We are <laughs> arguing over things that is clear wrong. Women on the nation, I don't know how that is the discussion. You, you can't open up the Bible and find it anywhere. There is no text that supports it. You have to throw away, Paul says, above every man is Christ. Above every woman is the man. You got to throw that away. We're having discussions about stuff that we used to know by the time you were six. We have discussions now about homosexuality within this church. They ordained a woman who is in favor of LGBTQT in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? Because the counterattack was going to come also to the glorious land. That's the importance. It wasn't going to leave the glory also into the glorious land. And what we knew, know about Israel of old is that when he came to his own, his own received him not. He did miracles to his own. They didn't receive. Mm -hmm. 1915, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Let me ask, I, I, I posed this question to a bunch of ladies once. They weren't too happy. I actually would, I just made a statement. Uh, and the statement was, many of you guys would strangle Christ if he was here. Because he would not approve of woman ordination. Then what would you do? Well, this is how I feel. He's not going to change the word just because you feel a certain way. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. That means I want to be the queen of England. Take up your cross and follow me. You see, so, so when Christ was here, his own people crucified the king, crucified the king. We only have one king, which is Caesar. The people denied him. Now, remember Daniel 9, 24. Physical Israel was now going to be gone. Jesus said in Matthew um, 23, 38, your house is desolate. God's president, the kind of glory, is gone. So the city is gone. The people are gone. The people become spiritual. And something happens. The city then, which was local, must also move. I want to read this note here, Ellen White. Um, I think I made the next couple of weeks, I'll have a little stuff from Ellen White just to reinforce the point. He says, again, Pilate proposed to release the Savior, but the Jews cried out, saying, if thou let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. They were adamant about persecuting Christ because he interfered with their desire to do their own will. 
Okay, let me take this one question from the internet. But the question really is, why involve Jesus if you don't like him, like your life? And furthermore, why involve the other one if you don't believe in either way mentioned? Okay, I'm not quite sure the question, but this is a question that came. It said, um, the question was, why involve Jesus if you don't like him? Live your life. And furthermore, why involve others, other one, if you don't believe in either way mentioned? Okay. Um, I, I guess I, I'm going I'm to answer the question this way. Um, some people say, why, why does the devil attack the church? Or why do people who have no intention of being a god stay in the church? Well, I know the Adventist church doesn't believe in woman ordination, but I'm not going to leave. I'm going to force them to do it my way. You ever ask yourself that question? There, there are other, yeah, I know. Yeah, there are other Seventh-day churches, you know. There's Seventh-day Baptists. There's the Brothers of Abraham. There's Seventh-day Pentecostal. Go join their church and become a pastor. Or as a friend of mine did, he started his own church. Why don't... Well, I know why some of them stay in, even though they don't have Christ. It's because they have a very high position, or they're teaching, or they're preaching, or they're you mm -hmm. know doing the personal ministries, or they get a lot of uh, they got a lot of praise, they get a lot of thanksgiving, they get a lot of prayer time. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go there because they don't do a public prayer. But I'm going to go an even step, a different step. The devil, I I'm going to put it on the screen for a second. Because this is the part that we don't like to address. It is far more than that. Listen to what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees. This is to John 8, 42. This is why they are there. They're secret agents. It says, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. You see, those who don't leave, they don't leave because they're on their master's business. Their master has an assignment for them to do. And their assignment is to deceive people. See, sometimes we don't we don't want to think that, right? But they have a master that is different from Christ. L let me let me before I go to Andrew, I want to put this up because I want to make this point abundantly clear. Some people say, why don't they leave? Why don't they just go someplace? And I use John 844. And sometimes people don't get it from that. Because John 844 says that their father was the devil. So what's the big deal? The devil has agents. Secret agents. And there's no sense sending your secret agents among your own people to deceive your own people. That's, that's not how secret agents work. Secret agents work to deceive the true people. So look how Paul puts it. This is 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13. He says, for such are false apostles. Deceitful workers. I want us to see that. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. The reason they stay is because they're double agents, secret agents. They are what you call the ministers of Satan. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of darkness. I mean, righteousness. You see, they remain there because they're on their master's duty. And the hope is that while you're in church, they catch you sleeping and they draw away from those who will be saved. You see, so that's the intention. They're secret agents. Just like the scribes and the Pharisees were secret agents. And Jesus called them out. You are of your father, the devil. And their, the, their, their assignment was to cause the entire nation of Israel to be lost. Sadly, 
the entire nation of Israel rejected Christ, except for the disciples, some of the women. And later on, some of the same Pharisees would repent on Pentecost. And the children. Yeah. Repent at Pentecost and turn around. But Jesus makes this point, and boy, uh, Jesus makes this point, because I made a statement, I don't know if anyone got it, this one is actually for my, for my wife, right, this is for my wife, um, I didn't give her an answer, but I'm going to give her an answer to one of her questions this week, um, I'm not going to tell her the answer, but I'm telling her this is the verses to one of her answer, right, Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he made it clear, 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 that there would be no more literal holy land or right. holy mountain. Yet he also made it clear that they would remain true worshipers. Notice what he says to her. This is in John 4, 20 to 24. Matter of fact, I'm going to put that on the screen. I don't know if she could read that for us or someone wants to read that for her. But this is an important text. This is John chapter 4, 20 to 24. I don't know if she could read. because Somebody's about a horn. Well, who wants to read this for us? It's John chapter 4, verse 20 to 24. Starts with our father's worship. You allow to read it because of 24. Okay, our fathers worship in this mountain. And he say that Jerusalem is the place where man ought to worship. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in the mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So did you see what Jesus just did? Because this is a statement I'm making. There be no more literal holy land or holy mountain. Now, notice what he says to her. This is such an important statement. Yep. The woman believes, our comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. She is a Samaritan. So where you worship, where That's Jerusalem good. is, it's going to cease to be the place to worship. He says, you don't know what you worship, but we know what we worship, salvation of the Jews. But, verse 23, the hour comes. Did that hour pass? Yes. Yeah, because, and now is. So when he was speaking, present perfect, when he was speaking, that was the hour that Jerusalem had ceased to be the place where you worship God. The hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him, God of the Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So where was correct? When Jesus had come, he ended salvation at Jerusalem. And he ended from where, some might say the Muslims or the mountains were, you could not find the true salvation there, but you can still worship in spirit and truth. Andrew, go ahead. I think the a lot of, in 1844 and around that time, there people across the whole world were getting revival and they're getting close to God and they're getting a second excited about the second coming. So it wasn't about a uh, denomination or uh, you know about a. Uh, the way to worship in a particular way, more more that they're loving Jesus, they wanted him to return. They wanted him to return. But now I want to. <laughs> but so Jesus makes that that statement. Neither in Jerusalem and John one twelve, he then says, "But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God." 
So while he definitely canceled Jerusalem, he does not cancel the individual from, from becoming a son of God, from becoming a true worshiper. And the hour was then. So when Ware talks about that the worship of God, God no longer has a literal people in a literal location, geographical location, Jesus verifies that statement. Their house is left to them desolate in Matthew 13, 23. They rejected him as a people in John 1, 11. And now he says that the hour was and now is when true worshipers don't worship in Jerusalem, they worship in spirit and truth. And so between that statement and something that will happen, God's people were not worshiping in a location per se, but they were worshiped in spirit and truth. Yeah, we have to worship in spirit and truth. Mm -hmm. So that's the key. Now, let me explain something. Now, I'm not giving an answer yet to Jerusalem. I'm giving some clues. <laughs> now, between the time of this statement of Jesus, all the way through the dark ages, God's people really couldn't have a place to worship. Do you know why? They were being persecuted. The Jews persecuted God's people and hunted them down. And so they were fleeing, they had to worship in spirit and truth. When the Jews ceased the persecution, persecute God's people, guess who picked it up for the next 1,260 years? The Roman, Roman Rome, pagan Rome. Yeah, persecuted the people for that long. Until I wanted, I was looking for a picture, and I'm, I'm going to put the bookmark here, and I don't want to give any more clues. I allow you to ask questions. My wife and I went down to South Carolina, wanted to find the Gullah people, the Gullah people. I'm a Gullah people, right? So we wanted to find the Gullah people. And so we get to South Carolina. We do find the Gullah people, but we found the Huguenots. 1582, the original building that they built when they escaped fleeing persecution, they came to America and established uh, a, a place of worship here in 1582, I think was the year. But I, I hope to find it and place it, that picture that I took on this page. You see, they couldn't worship in a place because they were being hunted. I'm gonna put a verse on the screen. They were being hunted down by the church. And it said, matter of fact, let me go to 15 first. And it says, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. And that means water here is people, woman is the church. So he cast out people like a flood after his remnant church. That he, the serpent, might cause the remnant church to be destroyed by the flood of people. And the earth an empty land, helped the remnant church, and the earth opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood of people that was coming to destroy the church, which cast, which a dragon cast out of her mouth. I'm not giving an answer yet, but God would set it in such a way that he would provide a place for his remnant people. Pretty much the same way that he did when he established Israel in the first place. Israel had been in captivity by Egypt. God delivered them, created a place for them where they could worship in freedom, created a place where they could worship in truth created a place in the center of the then known world where people from all known countries would come. And there he established literal glorious land that we call Israel over in what is North Africa, which they renamed Middle East after they built the Suez Canal, right? 
after, and I'm not giving an answer yet, but after the dragon stopped, well, so they say they escaped the dragon or the dragon's term of 1,260 years expired, God reestablishes a place where his people could worship in truth, where the law allowed them to establish true religion, where they could worship according to the dictates of their hearts, where every nation under the sun would come and the gospel could be spread back again to all the world. God established this nation. And next week, we're still answering the question, where's the glorious land? What is the glorious land? I gave you some possibilities. I didn't give you the right answer. Here. <laughs> I didn't give an answer. And right here. if you ask, I'm not going to tell you. So. Okay, so that's what I'm <laughs> concluding from all of this. So, Thanks for all those hints. <laughs> so I have some hints here that we could take a look to see what God did. And um, so that's where we're going to pick up. There's only like, I'm going to zoom through the pages, see a few pages left. And that's where we're going to finish Daniel. And I think there might only be six slides left. So next week is going to be somewhat quick. We'll use it for review, answering questions, because I'm just going to give the answer. And that's how we're going to end the study of the book of Daniel. I don't think there are seven pages left where we dig in. Um, we're going to begin at this page, looking at these verses um, about the establishment of Israel, the land flowing with milk and honey. Do you know something which is interesting? When I talk to a, a lot of family or immigrants, they talk about they came to America and they thought that the, there was gold on the streets. If you talk to some immigrants, as we said, they say, my parents thought there was gold and money for everybody. And they came and found out that was not the case because America was known as the land of milk and honey. Boy, you could do anything you want to if you're in America. And, you know, the ministry, we are supporting the establishment of two churches. So pray for us. And if you feel like donating, go to my website and you can donate. Um, we are establishing two new uh, churches overseas. One is in Punjab, um, Pakistan, and the other one is in Madagascar. And I'll tell you this, we transferred some money to Madagascar. And um, it's like 485 apples or whatever their money translates into for hundred dollars. And it was just amazing to see how much we can do with a hundred dollars. And then one lady said 1700, you completely changed the entire neighborhood. It was like amazing. So if you're impressed to donate, you can always go to the uh, touch of faith and donate there. And we are doing two new, um, church bodies, organizations overseas, Punjab, Pakistan, and in um, Madagascar, the leader in Pakistan is Hanif Masin, and the person in Madagascar is Nora, I can't even say her name. It's like 10,000 letters. I, I, I can't pronounce it. Um, as something Nora, N-O-O-R, letter, 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 I can't pronounce it. But just pray for that ministry. And this is where I'm going to stick the pen in for today. I'm going to have a word of prayer and I'm going to end. And then we have some time and we can answer some questions. So let me just pray as we end for today. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for this opportunity um, to start really looking at how Daniel ends because it takes us right to present day. And we are seeing so many conflicts in the world today because of this very thing, um, King of the North is retaliating. And the world is supporting what they perceive to be the glorious land and your people. But the Bible is complete and replete. Your people cease to be literal and local. And now they have become spiritual and worldwide. So why I want to thank you for the text, the abundance of evidence that you have left for us. And I pray that those who have tuned in would take the time and watch the video again. You know, go back on Facebook, hit the button over and over until they could finally see that your word is true. Be with us until we meet again. Keep us safe. Watch over us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me do this really quickly. Um, oh, I forgot. I got to hit these buttons. These button, this button, that button. And stop the recording.
And also, I'm on the screen. What's the other button I need to stop? <laughs> Too many stops and 